thanks, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Dan Cutting. Uh, my talk today is called Swifty. Uh, is it Swifty? Is it Swiftic? I don't know. What's what's the word for Swift-like code? Good Swift code. Um, the talk here is about uh, sort of idioms and uh, patterns, design patterns that, that have come out of the community in Swift over the last couple of years. Um, sort of a talk in two halves. I'll do that to start with, and then at, later I'll talk about uh, the Swift three changes that are coming and, and what that might mean for uh, the kind of code that we write. Um, there will be a lot of code in this talk. Uh, I hope that's okay for this this audience, I think so. It's a, it's a language appreciation society, after all. Um, but uh, if you want to ask any questions, please do. Um, just, just feel free to butt in. Cool. So it's about patterns. Obviously, the most, impatten, most important pattern of everything is the singleton. Right? Everyone loves singletons. If you do a uh, search on Google for Swift singletons, you'll find 503,000 articles about it. People really love singletons. Um, I'm not one of them. And if you search for Swift singleton bad, you get 360,000 articles. Um, so don't worry, I'm not going to talk about singletons in this talk. I thought I'd talk about more sort of interesting, uh, perhaps uh, more obscure or less well-known patterns that have come along uh, out of the community. And this is probably my favorite one, so I thought I'd start with this. This is the Phantom Types, um, which has just got the coolest name ever, I think. <laughs> Uh, so, what are phantom types? Well, let's start with an example. Can you read that? No, it's too bright. Uh, it's too bright. Can we turn the lights down a little? It's going to be a lot of this, so we have to uh, be able to read it. See? <laughs> okay, well, this is going to play havoc with the rest of my slides because uh, I kind of depend on colors, but anyway. Uh, we'll see how we go. So, um, where were we? Phantom types. Uh, some mo motivation for phantom types. Uh, let's say we've got a, uh, an old-timey cartoon spy, and he's, he's just seen an old-timey cartoon bomb, and he wants to write a report. So he, uh, he uses this app that someone's written. It's, uh, he types in his get spy report, types in his report, and it, it comes in as a string. Uh, the app then encrypts it, obviously, because we don't want to transmit plain text, and then transmits the encrypted report. Unfortunately, one of the newbies on the uh, app decided to comment that line of code out just to you know, do some testing or whatever, and it somehow made it into the code base. And so now we have the situation where the, the string from the report is uh, still in plain text, it doesn't get encrypted, and it gets transmitted, intercepted, bad things happen. So let's look at how phantom types could help with that. Um, phantom types, they have, a, they have a weird name, a scary name, a cool name. But really, all they are are uh, types that never get instantiated. So we've got here two phantom types, the encrypted type and the decrypted type. They're really just markers or attributes, placeholders, tokens, whatever you want to call them, uh, that you can apply to other types to, to give some information to that type. So instead of just dealing with strings in our app, let's use this, uh, this wrapper class, secret, uh, which wraps that string. And you can see the generic T there, uh, which we will use like so. So our transmit function will uh, require a secret message that is encrypted. In other words, it has the encrypted token applied to it. And so now, if we tried to do something like this, the, the get spy report function, instead of returning a string, now returns a decrypted secret, obviously, because it's coming straight in from the, the UI text view or whatever it is. Um, if you try to now transmit that, you will get an error. And instead of my lovely red uh, stop sign, it's now blue or gray or something. Uh, instead, of, instead of being able to tran transmit it, you'll get this, uh, this build time error, uh, which will say that you can't use a decrypted message here when, you're, when you should be using an encrypted message. And then this is what the encrypt function would, would actually do. So it will simply apply it, it'll, it'll obviously do the encryption itself, but then it will take the decrypted message and turn it into an encrypted message by just applying a different, different phantom type to that, uh, to that wrapper. And so then when you, uh, when you do that, all is fine. And you don't get a build error. So the nice thing about phantom types is that it takes the things that can go wrong at runtime, it makes them fail at build time instead. 
uh, which is kind of a cool, cool technique, and it's pretty much what the type system is there for. So let's move on. That looks really weird. <laughs> uh, they're Russian dolls, if you can't tell. Uh, the idea here is namespaces. So Swift obviously has the concept of modules already. Uh, a module is, is quite a large granular uh, namespace, basically, for your target or for your framework, your library. Um, but at the moment, there's no, there's no way to do sort of more, or there's no official way to do more, uh, more granular namespaces within your app. So you can't have uh, a namespace for this part of the app and a different one for that. Um, so for example, if, if you wanted to make a new type called array, uh, some struct array that you're building. This will cause problems when you, when you try to run it or try to, try to build it because obviously there's already a, an array type in the standard library. And you'll get an error. But the nice thing about Swift is uh, this idea of nested types. So this, is, uh, this basically means that you can embed types within other types, uh, nest them down as deeply as you like, and in particular, you can use classes, enums, structs to do this. So this kind of code is, is perfectly uh, fine, will compile fine, um, and then you can refer to these, these objects down through the layers using this dot notation. So we can use that to wrap this in a different type, another type, and it sort of looks like a namespace. Uh, it's, you know, it looks like a namespace in the sense when you're, when you're actually using the, the array. Um, but obviously we're wrapping in an enum rather than some sort of namespace, official namespace. And the reason we use enums here instead of, say, classes or structs is uh, you can't instantiate an enum directly. So this is kind of uh, signaling to, to the reader that you're not supposed to use the, the my project as an actual type that you instantiate. Um, obviously, you're still, you're still using an enum, which is not exactly how it's intended to be used, but this can work. Uh, and you could also use it for sort of organizing code as well. Um, so in your app, you might have uh, a components namespace, and then within that, you've got, say, a list <laughs> section for the list part of your app, a search, search part of the app, detail part of the app. Uh, and you can, in fact, declare all these namespaces in advance uh, like this, and then use extensions to, to actually put things in those namespaces, uh, which is good because it means you can spread this code out all over the place. And then you would refer to it like this. There is, there is one drawback with this approach. You can't put protocols inside these things. So you couldn't declare a protocol inside one of the namespaces um, for various type reasons. So it's not perfect. That's very hard to see what that is. <laughs> um, it's ink, suspension of red and blue ink mixed in water. Uh, so. This part, this, this pattern is mix-ins. Um, and you can think of mix-ins as building blocks for, uh, for your app or for your classes that add behavior to, to other types. So to give you a, a more concrete idea of what that means, let's say we've got, we're, we're building a game with some players and enemies and uh, we want them to be able to inherit certain behaviors somehow. So we've got uh, this, this idea that a player can move and an enemy can move, a uh, player has health, and so on. And there could be a lot of these different structs that you've created, and there could be a lot of these different behaviors that you want to apply to all these different types. Um, so obviously you can do something like this with inheritance. You could have a, a base class for like a moving object, and then you could subclass that to a player and an enemy and, and so on. Um, but because we have single inheritance in Swift, obviously you have to have a very rigid hierarchical tree for that, and you can't sort of cross, cross over and, and use the uh, behaviors however you want sort of fixed in this hierarchy. So wouldn't it be nice if you could do something like this? Uh, basically just a, a blob of behavior uh, with some, some implementation, some functionality in the functions, and some state in the, uh, the vars, and, uh, and just have this apply to these objects. And then you could just call move on player and move on enemy, and it would retain its state and, and keep it all up to date. So you can't do this in Swift at the moment. There's no such mix-in keyword. Uh, although there is a proposal in the Swift 3, uh, in Swift Evolution, sorry. There is a proposal for it. Hasn't got very far yet. So 
how close can we get with what we've got in Swift already? So there's, there's our mixing code, our ideal mixing code. First thing we'll do is just turn it into a struct. So it's exactly the same code, but it's now a struct. And we've added the, the name mix in to the end there, just to clarify it. Next thing we'll do is we'll make a protocol called can move, uh, which is the name of the mixin. And this has the, the interface for the, for the mixin, essentially, which in this case is just the move function. And so just by doing these two steps, uh, we can get kind of close. We've got now our player struct. We say it's a can move object, which means it's in, in conforming to that protocol. Then, of course, we have to implement the, uh, the function in the protocol. And we'll, pass, we'll basically trampoline those calls through to the, uh, the mix-in struct that we made. So all the state is nicely kept away in a struct, um, but we can still call move on, on the player object, which is great until you need to do it to another type. So now if you want to do the same thing for enemy, you have to write exactly the same code underneath uh, or inside the enemy struct. Um, and if you have a lot, of, a lot of these objects, that gets old pretty quickly. There's a lot of boilerplate code. There's going to be a lot of functions that you have to write as well. So a lot of copy and paste. Uh, so can we do any better? Well, some of you may be thinking, why aren't we just using protocol extensions? Right? This, this is kind of what they're for, right? You should be able to uh, add behavior to, uh, to anything that conforms to a particular protocol. And it is very useful. The problem with protocol extensions is they don't give you any state. You can't put state in the extension itself. So that's why we have to use this, this mix in struct. But we can use extensions uh, to inject all that boilerplate code. So anytime we have to write this boilerplate code, we can instead just put it in a single extension for the, for the mix-in, and it will put that into all the classes that need it, the structs, uh, sorry, the, uh, the player and the enemy. Uh, and there's just one little catch to that. The extension obviously doesn't know anything about the can move mix-in struct, so it needs to know about that. And so we'll just declare that as a property on the protocol itself. And because the structs already have that, it'll all just work. So that was the ideal. That's what we wanted to get, get to. And this is what we actually get, which is pretty close. Um, the only thing we have to do is declare these properties uh, for each mixin, which <coughs> instantiates the, uh, the state object. And then that, that'll just work. And we don't have to copy any more boilerplate code around. Um, <clears throat> so you're probably thinking at this point, well, there's a lot of hacks here. <laughs> uh, phantom types, they're, they're kind of cool. Um, maybe they're, they're arguably good practice because we're, uh, you know, we're using the type system in a way that perhaps it is intended for. Namespaces, probably not so much. We're kind of uh, overriding enums for our, for our own purposes there, which is a bit confusing. The mix-ins thing, um, it's kind of neat that might be a bit confusing if you actually came across that in code, I think. Um, and there's a bunch of other patterns like type erasure and so on. And they just get weirder and weirder. So you're probably just wondering, is this really good practice? Uh, I'd say it is, it is good, right? We need this stuff. We need to uh, explore what we can do with a language. We need to see, uh, push the boundaries and, and see what we can get out of it. And it is a young language, so we're still trying to figure out what is actually Swifty code. Um, so all this stuff has come from the community. Of course, we also have the uh, uh, Apple itself and the open source project, um, which are pushing Swift in other directions, or in, in much the same direction, but they have their own ideas. Um, <clears throat> you can actually read that. That's good. So these are some of the Swift evolution proposals that have been um, proposed. Uh, about two-thirds of the ones that have been proposed for Swift 3 have already been implemented, uh, and there's, there's more being created every day. Um, but the, the primary goal now for Swift 3 is consistency, so making the APIs consistent. Uh, the way you use it should now start to feel more Swifty. There should be more of an identity. Uh, and there are API design guidelines that uh, sort of lay all this stuff out. Um, so one of the, the main things at the moment is 
uh, well, one of the main features of Swift, I should say, is this uh, idea of mutability when you need it. Um, so by default, you tend to want to try and use immutable objects, value type objects, uh, which is the let concept. Uh, and then when you do need mutability, you can use var and, and so on. The problem is with uh, foundation, which is obviously a massive framework that we all rely on all the time. Uh, it, it's a very Cocoa-oriented, well, it is Cocoa, basically. Uh, the, the way you use it is, uh, it's designed in a way that is not exactly the way that Swift is meant to be used, or not intended to be used. So you end up with code like this in your Swift code, which doesn't feel quite right. You've got uh, the NSURL, put that in a URL object, and if you want to append something to it, you, you do it with this URL by appending path component, putting it back into the same object again. Uh, and this, this just doesn't really feel like Swift, right? So in Swift 3, and in fact in the, the snapshots now, I think it's already implemented, you can do this instead. Uh, first thing to note is the NS has gone from URL. It's just URL now, and that is applied across foundation. Um, and now a var URL is actually a, a var type. You can do things to it uh, rather than uh, ask it to do something, give you an object, and put it back into the same object. So now you've got these new methods, uh, functions like append path component, uh, which will modify the actual object. And if you use let instead of var, then that will also feel more swifty, because now when you try to do this, you will get an error. So. Consistency with, uh, within the language itself, but also consistency with foundation frameworks is, is very important for Swift 3. Uh, so I've got just a, a grab bag of a few other points from um, the proposals. We've got this one, scoped access. Uh, this looks like perfectly uh, innocent code, I think. We've got a public function there, which increments a private value. If I were to write this, uh, what do you think would happen? Would the, the code run fine and the value would be updated? Or would the, the code crash? Or Yeah, exactly. So in many other languages, you would expect this to just not even build, right? Because the, the value uh, property is private. And you're outside the scope. It shouldn't, it shouldn't even compile, uh, a lot of people would argue. In Swift, this would, this would compile and run just fine if this code was inside the same file as the class. So private doesn't actually mean private to the scope that it's in. It means private to the file that it's in, which is surprising, I think. And so this is, uh, this is changing. Um, in future, it will be as you would expect. And if you still want the old behavior, there will be a new access type called file private. Uh, this is not implemented yet. This one has actually been around for a very long time. I think it's a very early proposal, and it still hasn't been implemented. So. Not sure if it's, it's difficult or no one wants to do it or what, but. Uh, no escape. Uh, by default, at the moment, blocks, uh, sorry, closures are uh, escaping, which means if you pass a block, a closure, to a, uh, a function, there is the possibility that it can escape that uh, function and possibly be saved somewhere or passed onto some asynchronous thread or, or something like that. And, uh, and that's useful, obviously, because you need it for things like callbacks. But it's, it's kind of against the, uh, the way that Swift is turning out. The, the idioms for Swift are now to be more sort of functional. So you do something, you come back. Uh, try not to have too many side effects. So there is already a at no escape uh, attribute that you can apply. And what that will do is uh, say to the compiler that the, uh, the closure here will be used and uh, be, it'll be used and not copied anywhere else or not used anywhere else by the time that the function that it's in returns. So it's perfect for this kind of code where you just want to do something with the with the closure and then exit. Um, and it's like I say, it, it's good for the the kind of code that we should be writing with Swift. So by default, that will that will now be the uh, the default option. No escape will be the default, and that keyword will disappear. And if you want to be able to escape a function, a block, escape a closure, then you will need to do that explicitly. Just a couple more now. This is a, a very simple one. Uh, let's say we've got two protocols, drama and comedy, and then we have a uh, breakfast club 
type, which is a drama comedy, perhaps the best drama comedy. At the moment, you would declare it like this. You use this protocol, angle brackets, to say this type is of a, it's a protocol which conforms to drama and comedy. And the new syntax will get rid of the protocol and the angle brackets and just use this ampersand notation instead. Um, which does make more sense, like the, the one above, the, the, the one that's there at the moment, it's a bit unclear if that means it could be drama and comedy or drama or comedy. Um, this obviously makes it clearer. It gets rid of some angle brackets as well. And the angle brackets are particularly important in generics. If you do it the old way, when you're doing a, a function declaration like this, you get just angle bracket, angle bracket, angle bracket. Um, angle bracket blindness, it's called. And for loops. So C style for loops are gone in Swift 3. But we still had the, the, uh, the Swift way of doing it. We've got ranges that we can just iterate over like this. There is a new uh, proposal as well for sequences. Um, obviously, sequences have been around since the beginning. But uh, this new way of writing sequence code is much, much easier, I think. So you just, uh, you just call the function sequence. You give it the first value you want to use. And you give it a little closure, which uh, is able to calculate the next, the next uh, instance. Very, very nice, very simple. Um, if you were to run this code, of course, you'd get an infinite sequence. It would never exit. You'd just print every number. Um, so there are also some other things coming in. There's this prefix function, which will just let you take, say, the first four and then exit. So I think we'll be seeing a lot more of this kind of code uh, in loops. There is another form of the sequence as well, another form of sequence function. Um, let's say we want to do a Fibonacci sequence, which is not quite as easy to do using that other approach. Uh, what you can do is pass in a state object. So we, you know, we've got a struct here which contains the state for the current and the next Fibonacci number. We construct our initial state, we pass that in, and then we give it a block again. Um, Every, every call to the block will get a, cop or get a pointer, basically, to this, um, to this state object. And it's an in-out variable. So what that means is we can modify the, the values in it uh, and keep updating the state as we go. And then we can just return the actual value that we want to get for any particular point in the sequence. And so this is how we might update the, the state object. We just calculate the next Fibonacci numbers and rearrange the, the values there. Uh, and you might notice that in this particular code, this will not give you the actual Fibonacci sequence because it won't start at the first number because we will update the numbers before we return the, the current one. So that leads me to my last little uh, nice idiomatic piece of Swift, which is the defer keyword, which I love. It's just awesome. Uh, it basically lets you run a block of code after the scope exits. So it'll, it'll return current. You can think of this as returning current and then just after it's done that, but before it gets back to whoever called it, just run that little bit of code there as well. And this is really good for obviously cleaning up and, and things like that, but it's also really good for, for cases like this where you would otherwise have to make a temporary variable or something and install the current value. Um, so that's it. Wow. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hope you found something interesting in there, or at least something you haven't heard of before. Uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll find out more of these patterns and idioms as we go further and further, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of Swift 3. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Not so much a question as a, a remark. Uh, the Apple uh, Gameplay Kit actually does use something very much like your mix-in uh, pattern oh, okay. in uh, doing more or less what you were doing, because I, I think that's the best solution for that particular problem. So it's, it's, it's the official, yeah. it's there, <laughs> and we just now need to have a better syntax and a better way of, of doing that uh, with other options. Oh, cool. Yeah, I would like to see a mix-in keyword. Uh, seems like it should be easy to do. I keep running into the problem um, 
of how to do uh, dependency injection into storyboard instantiated view controllers. Is there a nice swifty way of doing that maybe with that mix-in trick? Like I, I think I want to declare a view controller as network controller injectable or something and just have the type checker make sure I get everything right and then be able to substitute in another implementation in tests. Have you found a good solution for that? I don't know. Um, Yeah, I mean, does, does that rely on, um, does Swinject rely on uh, Swizzling with Objective C under the hood? Yeah, there are obviously a lot of uh, dependency injection frameworks around. Um, I, I don't know if you could use the mix in trick for that. Uh, it'd be interesting to have a look there. Cool. Uh, any more questions? Awesome. Why uh, would you use um, phantom types instead of protocols? Like, for example, having an encryptable protocol perhaps for the thing that you're doing, and then when you're trying to send it, you'd be passing in an encryptable, and you'd encrypt it always before it's sent. That's very specific to that case. So are there cases that you definitely use phantom types instead of protocols? Um. I don't, I don't know if there's any that you would definitely use one or the other. I think it's sort of a case-by-case -case thing. You would, you would want to have a look, but um, sounds good, like we have an example. The good example I've seen is currencies. Mm. So each currency can be a phantom type, so you can make sure the currencies are added right, but you don't want, you all want them conforming to the same thing. You don't, it just allows you to have an extra thing on the number and tell it only to add things where the currencies are the same and that sort of thing. Yeah, Natasha the robot did a great post about using uh, phantom types for currency conversion. Uh, it looks it looks quite quite insane when you read it the first time, but uh, it's it's pretty amazing what it's actually doing. Yeah, I, I'm actually using phantom types in something I'm working on at the minute. So there's like a um, a contact type, and there's different types of contacts. So the contact, you know, it's just got like the name and address and stuff like that, but they're different kind of people. So you can have a contact that is a, a baker or a candlestick maker or whatever. It just means that then you cannot assign the wrong kind of person to that variable. Yeah, I guess in cases where you have exactly the same information in each, uh, you know, each different case, so this, the contact details would be the same whether you're a baker or a candlestick maker, but uh, you don't want to have separate classes for those. Um, so yeah, it, it's basically just an attribute that you can just tack on to any other type. 